Aloha, my name is Paul Udell. For many years, I was a newscaster here in the islands and on the mainland. Right now, I'm a volunteer here at Olelo, helping out with a program called Getting to Know You. The idea is to get behind what we normally know about a person to what really makes them tick. Our subject today is Kanishki, the great sumo wrestler born right here in Hawaii, both his parents from Samoa, and he retired in 1996. About 10 years ago, he built this beautiful house in Miley, right on the coast. He looked around a lot of places to uh, see where he should build, but he decided right here. And one of the reasons was, well, he used to go body surfing out there. Remember the big guy? But if you really want to know him, you've got to go a couple of miles from here, up to Nanakuli, to the compound that he built around the area where he actually grew up. Konishki, or Sally, and that's the only way you're known around here, has joined us now at the compound that, that you built for your family, and right at the Emu, a very special place, too. Yes, well, um, in Hawaii we all know it's an Emu, but because I'm a Samoan boy, we call it Umu. We just changed the I and the U, but this is where my family was, uh, and many other families that were connected to the family actually started their lives here in Hawaii. This very land here that dad bought maybe about 40 years ago. So you built this compound just a few steps from where you grew up? Yes, actually, um, we grew up like just, if you go behind my house, there's a church there, and that's where we were kind of raised. They used to call it the Nanakuli. And people in Nanakuli are people who went to Samoan churches nearby because it's called the, Nan the Samoan village. And it's still, we, it's there, there today, the church that we, we all went to. Tell me about life when you were growing up. How many in the family? Well, we, to be honest with you, I was growing up, because I'm the second youngest in our 10 kids, I thought we had like 50 kids in the family. <laughs> we lived in a house, we had relatives, and in mom's side of the family, they all came from Samoa. Dad's side of the family all came from Samoa. And when they got here, they, they had no jobs, no one was, was actually had certificates to American citizenship at the time, some of them. And you know, and just living here was, they needed somebody to head, kind of head start them, yeah? But yeah, we have 10 kids in our family, but we grew up raised with all our other cousins that came in from South Wong. 10 kids and relatives and everything. I mean, how many rooms did you have? We didn't have rooms. We only had two rooms. Two rooms? Yeah. <laughs> and then we all sleep in the parlor. One huge room, like see this Samoan mat here. It'd be laid on the ground. On the floors, you got dad, mom, and whoever the baby of the family or some older brother, sibling got a baby that year. It sleeps between then my sister and me, my brother. It's just one, just on the floor. Just like Samoa. What did you think about living like that? We never had a... Uh, thing in there, we never questioned how we lived growing up, and uh, because it was everybody was a strong bond of the family was the main, the source of whatever we did, the good, the bad, the, the fights between each other, you know, everything the source, and the source was controlled by two strong people, which was my mom and my dad. So it didn't matter what you think; it was it's what the family thinks. And this is how we were uh, raised as a family, you know. And then I, I, I shouldn't be talking back to my brother who's two years older than me. If we get into a fight, I'm the guy who's going to get hit in the head by my dad. You know, it's just the respect that you, you have in a, you have in a home and that we, we have. Your dad is uh, a strict disciplinarian, right? A re very religious person. I, I've met him, and, and he is a very religious person. Tell me about going to church and uh, the discipline. Uh, you must have wanted to play sports sometimes, but I'm sure <laughs> it was different. Well, the, before I guess I was, I was brought into the world, I guess the other brothers and sisters already started that. Everything was mandatory that you be part of church, part of uh, chorus groups, part of youth groups that was formed by the church. 
So when I was born, before I knew I could walk, I think I was already going to church. But the only problem is, as I grew, fell in love with playing football, fell in love with the beach, you know, like any other kid would, you know, stuff that you want to do, but there's church stuff you have to do. But I never missed it because I knew what it was coming if I do miss it, you know. And then my dad was a very strict man. Anything you outside of this yard, it's far. So just to step out of the yard, you need permission from your mom. She has to know exactly where you're going, where you're going. If she said no, then it's no. There was time we loved the beach so much. The beach was our playground. We are from the west side, and not only we are now, we have the most beautiful beaches. When we even wanted to go to the beach, if we, she, he said yes and said only 30 minutes, you better, you better haul your butt to the beach and haul it back before 30 minutes up because he was serious about 30 minutes, you know. You were a big, big kid. You got into football. I got, in, I got into a lot of things. We grew up in this area where everybody was at the boxing gym. They used to have a boxing club here in Nanakuli. The old theater they used to call it the James Aki Theater. We have it. There was an open roof theater here in Nanakuli. Used to be a gym where everybody went, and you know all the Samoan kids or the locals here would, you know, boys would go. The beach was everything to us. We played football there. We fished. We camped. We dived. And we did everything at the beach, you know. So. How did you get into sumo? What, what was the origin of it? Oh, well, originally, I didn't know nothing about the sport. Uh, and I was, uh, it, it happened by accident. When I was in Waikiki one day, it was like a month outside of graduating from high school. And I was actually down by the wall, the wall meaning across the cup, by the zoo, the wall. And then um, I was just actually cutting class. We, we didn't go to school. It was that last couple of weeks where Tests are done, you know you're graduating, and all they're trying to do is get you to come to school to sit in classes so you can go and do rehearsals for, for your graduation day. Walk the line. I never went to a rehearsal. Me and my boys just got into my car. We went to school in the morning, ate breakfast, and got in the car, <laughs> went to the beach, and we just went body surfing and boogie boarding, and then just happened the guy who runs the boogie board stand was a very famous person himself. We, we know him here as King Yokea. He's a famous uh, wrestler. That He was a worldwide big name. And he just one day called me, pulled me on the side and said, hey, son, you, you know, I think you really be a sumo wrestler. I thought, oh, uncle, you know, I don't know what is sumo. What, what is sumo, you know? Yeah. He started explaining to me, but, you know, like we in Hawaii, we respect our elders. We have to sit and listen. When they tell you sit down, you sit down and listen. That's the only reason I sat down. But this constantly happened for like three, four days. And because he's always at the beach and he sees me, he's always pulling me on the yeah. side. Yeah. So that's where it all started and until the last time I met him. He said that um, the man that actually opened up the doors for, for us foreigners to go to sumo was Jesse Takamiyama. And Jesse Kolo from Maui, and he's, he was coming. I knew who he was, never saw him in action, mm -hmm. but I kind of knew him because of commercials and stuff like that I saw, mm -hmm. but I never know what he did. So um, all I knew, he was famous. And then, like any other local boy, well, I get to meet a famous person. I never went into a Waikiki hotel, and they was treating me to dinner or to lunch or whatever it was, so free food. So. You try to feed up some boy like me, I'll be happy to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so you accept that. You go for sumo. Mm. You go to Japan. You run into the stables. Tell me your first impression of what it was like to be at the stable. Well, first of all, uh, when it, before I left, it took me only one month to make the whole decision to go. You know, I, I, right in where we're sitting today, my parents wanted me to go to college so bad. My mom, and my parents wanted me to go to school, but um, never leave the island. If they, they told me, if you go to school, just go to local Liver Community College, which is nearby. You can go and, you know, do a part-time part job sure. while you stay here. But because the older siblings left to go to the States to go to school, some went to the military and never came back. And so for my parents, my, especially my mom, they want us to leave. So when I was deciding to go. I made all the decisions on my own. I never told my parents it's there a week before I left. So my dad, knowing that he was very, you know, as you guys met him before during this interview, he's a very spiritual man. Yeah. And uh, he sent me during the summer, we used to do this Bible schools that we had to go to during the summer. And you get tested 
and there's the test scores always come out on Christmas. And I did it for seven years, and I won it first place for se six years. I only took six, second place once. So he always thought I was going to be a preacher. Yeah. And mom just wanted me to go to school here and go work. So, and, he t and when I told him I was leaving to go to Japan, my mom cried so bad. And my dad was like, didn't know what to say. I thought you was going to be a preacher. The only reason I went to church is because you told me to go. Really? I'm just following your orders. But, you know, I don't think it's not for me. But, you know, one thing I told my parents before I leave, you know, it's, it, I know you guys are so religious. Our family was brought up in church. I told them, you know, the Lord had different ways of sending the messages out there. I think um, I was just one of the tools that, through your prayers, I was used to go out and, and send the message in a different way. Because I do help people. I do talk to people. I try to support a lot of things. And I think that's a different way of supporting or being part of religion. You know? So when I left, everything was, my mom never said a word. The whole week, uh, the last week, the last word she said was at the airport, she said, don't go. Wow. And I just try to fight it strong and I left. But when I get to Japan, it's a whole new game. There's no English in my way. Getting to our airport was a problem. We got there, you know, there's things that I didn't go. I left Hawaii with just a shoulder bag. Wow. I had my Bible. I had my picture album with my family and friends in it. So, and I left, if you go back and look at photos that I, I left and had a lava lava, ifai kanga, we call it in Samoan. It's a dressy uh, pareo with pockets. Mm -hmm. And the shirt my mom bought that morning, he went, she went to a Samoan store before, during going to the airport and she bought a shirt that says Samoa on it. She said, wear this when you go. But the only thing, the other thing I had in my shoulder bag was a slacks, shoes, and shirt. I figure present, present myself properly when I get yeah. to Japan, yeah. and nothing happened. I went with, I got on a plane, I started crying because I was like, Jesus Christ, what did I do? You know, I'm going to a place I don't know nothing about, and you know, my parents is all pissed off, mom is crying, you know. There's no way I can go home now, you know. So, got to the airport, nobody's waiting there. Found out that I needed money to pick airport taxes. You had to buy this ticket when you was in Tokyo. Never had that money. Got some locals to help you get out. Then I get out. No one's waiting for me at Narita. And then at the hotel, oh, I get back to Tokyo. You know, talking to local. You have to catch the bus. Oh yeah, does it cost? Yeah, it cost money. Then they paid a. I didn't have one penny. I left Hawaii with zero. Wow. I told my mom, don't worry about it. They said I don't need any money. So it's <laughs> that's how it is. I left with zero. Wow. You know, and, and I didn't know I had money until I got to Japan. One of my school friends, her, his mom, Mrs. Takara, who's like a Japanese mother to me, he's a year younger than me, and he went to school with his son, Matt Takara. And then I opened her, 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 her card and said, Gambate, she has it, good yeah. luck in Japanese. And she had a $20 bill there. And that's the only money I, I knew. Oh, I had money. But I never checked it until I got into Tokyo. Yeah. But getting it was everything was like unreal. They had press waiting. You know, there's a there's a big Hawaii boy coming in to sumo. What did you weigh at that time when you when I was you like arrived um, probably three three twenty maybe three twenty. Yeah. So what was the discipline like? Discipline is there's nothing worse than nice about the sumo because I was 18 and new to the stable. I was the very bottom of everything. Meaning, if there are guys who joined with me, but they were 15 years old, but they joined like a week before I did. So I their seniority. It's not the age, it's how early you join the stable. Mm -hmm. So the seniority happens the day you get there. So you were at the bottom, so you, you had wash, to do the dirtiest stuff, huh? The dirtiest stuff. You wash, you clean, you cook, you run errands, everything. You're the last to sleep, the first to get up, the last to eat, the last to shower. You're the, I call it dirt bag. You know, I used to get up at my first six months of sumo, I used to get up like 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning, and we lived in a building that was four stories high. And we, I had to clean all the stairs, all the toilets, all the shower rooms before I had to go to school. My sumo school, which I had to go within a six month span. And every day, and those days we didn't have mops, was on your knees, wiping every stair. Did that for like what, six months, you know, and went to school. I left the house like maybe five o'clock, walked to the school and you know, winter, my first experience of being damn cold and we only was wearing something that we call it, you call it like kimono, but it's like as thin as the shirt I'm wearing. So I'm freezing the butt, you know. 
So what I did, I would leave so early, nobody's on the road anyway. I used to take my blanket, cover myself, and I used to walk to school. And now when I get to the school, I'm always the first one there. Always the first one there. I would turn on the stove and I would I'd put my belt, the what you call mawashi, the belt that we use for sumo, and I'll put it around the fire to make it warm before I put it on. So guys would walk in there and they're like, they find me sleeping in the school because I would get into the school earlier did, than anyone. Did you want to come home? Did you call oh, home always. and all that? Well, at the beginning, I couldn't call. I had no money to call. <clears throat> and the sad thing about it is every, uh, then you hear things after, I only call like once a month or once every two months. I had no money to call. But I made it a purpose not to call at all. I didn't want my family to worry. Even to this day, they don't even know my, they don't know how to get in touch with me in Japan. You know, and uh, when I when I got good enough to make money, I called every day and talked to my mom. But I I would not call anybody, anyone during the tournament. My last phone call is like a Saturday before the tournament. I tell mom, dad, tomorrow's tournament, and I won't talk to you guys until the tournament is done. So, so we didn't even know I was in the hospital until the media found out that I got hurt. And got hurt. Yeah. Okay, we got uh, the rule now is what. One foreigner for, for each stable. Yes, one you know, per stable. You know, we here in Hawaii, we were so used to watching you guys. You know, now we have nobody to watch. Is, is there somebody coming up that maybe we can watch? A local boy? Who, well, who uh, be Musashi a Maru's nephew, yeah. who's another Penitani. The boy is only 18. Good size. He just, he's just like his uncle. And he just started this uh, tournament here in September. And he had a winning record. So I think he's going to develop to be a good good one. And, um, you know, it's, it's the popularity of sumo is, is actually not as huge as when we were doing sumo. And I think the biggest change is because we had Akibono Musashi Maru. When I retired, Akibono Musashi Maru was going against these two other grandchildren who were brothers who was like the princes of sumo. Mm -hmm. You know, princes of prince, whatever it is. Anyway, their brothers are very popular, Wakataka. And um and there was like just two foreign local boys who was pounding back and forth. They couldn't win consecutive turn because Musashi Maru would win, then you, they would win, then Akebono would win. So mm -hmm. you, it had a great story line mm -hmm. every single tournament, you know. But the only bad thing about it that Akebono and Musashi Maru had to beat each other to win the tournament most of the time because they're from different stables. Yeah. Wakataka weren't so. They had kind of an advantage on that side. There's a lot that goes on with sumo that we're not aware of. Now, you retired. Um, where's your home, really? I mean, you got a beautiful place mm. right on the water. You've got this compound for the family. It's not too far away. But you're spending huge time in Tokyo and actually in, around the world. Where, where is your home? My home is in Tokyo. And, uh, it's been my home for 32 years now. Um, left in 82 and never came back, you know. so. I'm actually um, stationed in Tokyo. I know you've retained your popularity. Mm. You're real busy over there. Give me a sense of, of your average day over there in Tokyo, because people still know who you are. You're on TV and so forth. Well, at, in presently, I do a kid show that I've been doing for 11 years. It's on every morning and every early evening. It rolls two times. It's an educational show, and it's it's probably the for the past couple of years now, almost 10 years, 11 years, it's been the number one children's show on TV. That's one of the things that it gets me busy. The other thing I do is I'm a DJ. I have a radio show, and I've been doing it for years since I've retired now. And that's like the basic, that stays. So I have to work everything around it. So the other thing I do, I do tours in Japan, singing tours, which I sing. I have 12 albums, 13 albums, or something like that. It, it, I do music. I do, um, I actually do promotion, I promote, I produce, and I coordinate events on my own. I create my own venues. When I do my tours, everybody think I have a big staff. No, I call the venues. I see how much would it cost, and then I find out how much I can, I can get sponsored. I find out, I get my wife and I get all the tickets from my team, get all the hotel money. We do everything from scratch, everything. Even and then that's work, and then I do a lot of motivation talks for a lot of corporates, companies. I come in and talk to a lot of foreign, international business companies because of being from a foreign country coming to Japan. It's hard. The lifestyle is different. The way of life is different. The way of thinking is different. I do a lot of that, and um, and, and, and I, the uh, 
tsunami and the destruction that it caused. You've been involved in trying to help the people out over there. That's only now just past few years because of the tsunami, but I started my foundation, which is the other thing. I have started in 1996, the year I was retiring, called it the Konishki Kids Foundation, mm -hmm. and um, actually purposely working with the Wai'anae Coast. And my thing was um, I found a purpose, or I found that if I can take the kids outside of the comfort zone, which is our communities, and see something different, I think would change the way, the way they look at things or the way uh, they approach going to school now. Now they have a purpose or reason why they should be good, you know? So, yeah. so and so then busy. I, very busy. I, I, the tsunami was the latest that everybody saw on TV it was it really painful for me. You know, I, I think I do owe a lot to Japan for giving me the opportunity I have today. Being in sumo has changed my life, has changed my family's life. And um, I'm very appreciative about that. And I always feel like I have to give back. I never think I have given back enough. So 2011, you know, March 11, the tsunami hit. I got a bunch of, from my friends, got about two, four ton trucks loaded with water. And we started going there since April 3rd, 4th, like less than a month later. And it was hard from the very beginning. So I, I saw that place damaged from the very beginning to now. We, I was my last visit was just there in June, and we I've visited the place areas like 56 in areas. We have fed, we have cooked for like 20,000 people. I've delivered over 6,000 toys for Christmas for the kids, which I'm working. That's when I'm going up next, in in, in early December. I deliver like another 3,000 toys for kids up there, and I go to all Head Start schools, different schools, and then I just was there in June, delivered like 8,000 boxes of shampoo, hand lotion, rinse, anything that they use, because a lot of them, there's, there's more than a few thousands, like maybe about 20,000 people still living at temporary homes. I mean, I have to ask you this. Here we are sitting here, and the family, mm. well, I would call the emu, mm. and you're a guy who has gone so far away, made a lot of money, mm. got a lot of fame. What do you think about that? I mean, think back over your life and starting here and going to where you are. What, how, how do you account for that? What do you think about it? I cannot see myself being in that, uh, that stereotype where people think once you're successful, you have money, you're being bling, you write, write nice cars, and I, I cannot feel myself. I tried. I tried. You I, tried? I tried to like, okay, I got hot rods, nice car. It wasn't me. I don't feel comfortable. I had a nice gold chains. Yeah. Then it wasn't comfortable. I had nice gold watches, the best Rolex watches. I wasn't comfortable. So, you know, the thing is, you can take the boy from Hawaii, but you cannot take the Hawaii from the boy. And, that's, and, and there's a lot of artists to sing about. And it's very true. For me, it's very true. I cannot feel like, and it just feels like un uncomfortable. If I put something more than another person, like worth something more than another person locally, I feel like you're just trying to be above people. It's not, but it's good to show some kind of success for the younger people to generate some kind of, get steamed about it. Like, oh wow, I see Konishki, he got a nice gold chain. I like one gold chain. How do you get there? You know, how you get there is what I want them to know. It doesn't come easy. And don't use what you have today as an excuse. Because you're poor, because you're that, you know. I started right here. This is where my family was starting, right in this emu. We cooked here. We had no kitchen. When I went to Sumo, this is a whole life right here. No one was in the house. We all gathered here. We cooked. We ate. We prayed here. In time to sleep, me and my brother, there was a like a platform right in the back where I'm sitting, and this is where me and my brother slept. Sometimes I slept on my, bro on, on my dad's truck, the flatbed, because I loved looking at the stars. I would just come and get my pillow and slip on the truck, and then I would get up like 4.30 in the morning because Dad would get up to go to work, so, you know. And it's the stuff that I, I grew up doing, you know. It's the stuff that I enjoy the most. And the only thing, like, next year, my goal is to go out and see my uncles, my cousins that I haven't seen for years. It's the people that I grew up, I know that the hardship that we all went through growing up with nothing. You know, and the money I make ain't nothing. It's all material. The house I have is material. I don't even 
think of much about it, you know? Well, I want to thank you for spending this time with us and really sharing your life with us. Well, this time I'm really glad. Um, first of all, this all started from an from a, a email that I got from Les. And, um, you know, I always want to try to do things with people here in Hawaii. And this time Olelo was, was uh, good enough to kind of set this all up. And the interview, I do a lot of stuff, but I haven't gotten really deep into who I am as a person or where I started from. And I think it's stories that it's good for our people. And, you know, I've been away so long, 32 years. I love Hawaii. I love Wainai, where I'm from. I like to represent the 808 state in everything I do. And that's why that's some of the pressures I leave because somewhere I always, I'm always worried about I might slip, you know. I might do something wrong, boom, it's negative. For, but, you know, I, I'm a very positive person. I take everything mm, kind of semi seriously because I want to smile every time I do something. You know, life should be, life should be happy. But again, we go and have things that we go through that makes us sad. But I'm just very happy to do this interview with Olelo and I hope it, it sends something out to our people, you know. Being away for 32 years, I slowly noticed the lower spirit that we talk about. We should not even talk, we should actually put action to it because Hawaii is, is a beautiful place. Everyone wants to come away, especially the Japanese people. They love Hawaii so much. And I hope um, after people seeing this is, is, is understanding everything comes with hard work and, and, and there's no easy way out. And um, I just hopefully all the, if, especially the kids, I, I love the kids in our people and they deserve better. Every kid that comes out of the Waianae Coast or any area, the kids that are not fortunate to have a lot of things, they do have a dream. And just hoping they all dream because, and don't take any excuses because I know we all can get out of the, the negative side and just be positive with everything and just strive for the best, you know. So I hope this uh, touches a lot of, not only people in Hawaii, but mostly the kids. I'm very keen on having kids be successful. Life is good. You only make it good if you make the choice to be good, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Gonna try again? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> See, that's me. I too nice. I like the old people win. <laughs> 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 ah. Okay. <laughs>